we have a blessing to have someone with us named Crawford Loritz. And uh, Crawford, his son Brian has been here on a couple of occasions and been a blessing to us, but today we get the OG. <laughs> we get the original version, oh, the and uh, what a blessing. Now, I can tell you some official things about him. Uh, he spent 27 years on the staff of Crew. Uh, right here, headquartered right here in Orlando. Uh, he's been 15 years the lead pastor of Fellowship Church in Roswell, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. He's authored nine books. He and his wife, Karen, have four adult children, 11 uh, grandchildren. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce him because he's a little older than me. Yeah. And that doesn't happen that often <laughs> around Discovery Church. And so um, we're thrilled to have him. And I, I, I wanted to just mention a couple. Of, he serves on a couple of boards, I found out. One of the boards he's on his crew, but he also serves on the board of Chick-fil-A. Do you get free sandwiches? No. Really? <laughs> they don't give you free sandwiches? No. Oh, man. Fries? No. Nothing. nothing. <laughs> oh. Huh. I guess they're tight financially. <laughs> you, not really. <laughs> you know, we walked in this morning, and just up till the beginning of the service, there's one thing I learned about him, and that is he knows more people in this church than I do. <laughs> based on the number of people that have greeted him. And speaking of greeting him, would you give a warm welcome to Crawford Loritz as he comes. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> While I do feel right at home, I do know a lot of people here. And uh, in fact, uh, I saw Larry and Debbie McKinney. We go back all the way to 1968. Yeah, I was only five, but <laughs> we met in college, and uh, we've been dear friends for quite a while, and it's been absolutely wonderful. In fact, I had a little flashback. Uh, when I seeing them, I remembered how I met my wife the following year there at, uh, in college. It was the beginning of my sophomore year, and um, the truth of the matter is, two weeks before I came back on campus, my high school sweetheart broke up with me. She kicked me to the curb. Can you imagine somebody getting rid of all of this? Yeah, I can see that. So, so yeah, this is a true story. So I came back and came, I, was, I was devastated. And so uh, I was in my dorm room. Again, true story. I was praying to God, no more women. They mess you up every time. This semester, I'm going to be you and me, Jesus. I'm going to stay focused on my relationship with you and not to be distracted or deterred or disrupted in any way. Me and Jesus. And um, I got up off my knees and uh, started walking down the street to another building on campus and uh, mind filled with this deep-seated stalwart, single-minded commitment to Jesus not to be disrupted or disturb, dis disturbed in any way. And people who know me know that when my mind's made up, I can be fairly focused. And so uh, rehearsing this thing and I get to this one building and open the door and I see this young lady that I hadn't seen before. And all of a sudden, I got healed. <laughs> Just like divine healing took place there. And uh, so my mama taught me to be hospitable to strangers, and she was new on campus. And so I said, uh, my name is Crawford Loritz. What's your name? Well, my name is Karen Williams. I said, well, you know, I've been assigned to be your tour guide. And so <laughs> and been showing her around now for almost 52 years. She's the joy of my life. It's just really... Yeah. We've got a long ways to go and a short time to get there, so if you have a Bible or a device or an extraordinary memory, I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 9 and just leave it open there for a while. Holy Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace in our lives. You have been better to us than we could ever dream or imagine. And we ask of you that you will forgive us for those waves of entitlement that wash over us from time to time. God, give us the extraordinary ability to focus and concentrate today. I'm very well, well aware of the fact that nobody needs to hear my stories or miscellaneous ramblings about life or experiences. Um, but we can't make it without a word from God. So Lord, I pray that you will speak you wrote a book. These are your words. It's the voice of God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll arrest our attention. 
Move in a great way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Several weeks ago, when I, uh, Don called and um, he told me about the series that uh, uh, the church is involved in right now, Made to Grow, I was really excited about that, the emphasis on discipleship. For various reasons, I don't think that there's a greater emphasis nor a greater need than right now uh, clarity with regard to what it really means to be a follower of Jesus over against the cultural Christianity that often um, grabs us by the lapels and over against the thinking that we can incrementalize ourselves into transformation. That all that we have to do is just, you know, get progressively better as if we are the center of our Christianity as if we pick and choose what is effectiveness and effective and when it is to be effective. But the problem with that approach to Christianity is that you never quite get there. You just never, you're never gonna meander your way into change. You'll meander your way into accommodation, you'll get incrementally better, but you won't become transformed. You see, when you're born, you look like your parents, but when you die, you look like your decisions. You look like your choices. You look like what you decide to be. And often those decisions, depending on, on, on what it is that you're going after, those decisions, they have to be exclusive. Meaning, that there's a choice to be this, which means I choose no longer to be that. That Christianity is not a composite picture of a lot of things that I choose to be. That Jesus is not here to make us a better version of ourselves. But he's here to transform us, to change us. And I'm going to step into two very hard-hitting narratives that demand radical choice and decision. I've been a believer since I was 13 and a half years old, and don't do the math, I'll tell you how old I am. I'm 73 right now. <laughs> Nobody's ever applauded oh, <laughs> that before. Yeah, you know, in fact, I tell you, my, my youngest, my oldest son, Brian, who's been here before, he's such a nutcase. Um, so I do some, still speak at some things where there's a younger crowd, and so I don't know how to dress these days, okay? Just to let you know, I don't know what, I, so I call him every once in a while. Well, he got tired of me calling him. I, I said, Brian, I'm going to this thing. He said, no, Dad, hold, just time out, Dad, time out, okay? Look, you're old. Just do you, and they'll understand. So at any rate, that had nothing to do with this, and I forgot where I'm going. But at any rate, uh, uh, crises, as you read the New Testament, you'll discover crises, crises is the prerequisite to transformation. In fact, decision precedes development. Decision, choice, precedes development. And in the Bible, discipleship, yes, there are, there's process there, and we do grow, um, but, 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 but the, it's the choice, it's the decision first that produces dynamic development. And this is what Jesus is after. I, um, there are two narratives here that I wanna point your attention to uh, where Jesus picks up the, the topic of discipleship and what it really is and then what it is not. I'm gonna speak in terms of what it is not in this first part of the message and then over to Luke chapter 14, I want to talk about the three primary pillars of New Testament discipleship. And you'll discover a thread there. Jesus is pushing toward exclusive decision. Exclusive decision. 
He's standing back saying, no, you're, you're not, you're, you're not going to add me to your philosophies. You're not going to add me to the other important things about your lifestyle. It's as if he says, no, 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 you don't get this. I am your life. You got, you got to decide that. that. That's a choice. I pastored and I've watched people get stuck in this up and down or this parentheses and this kind of thing. You know, and I don't mean to be simplistic, but as you poke at what the problem is, it, there's a failure to make the choice to be all in. Luke chapter 9, the last paragraph of Luke 9, beginning at verse 57. Jesus confronts three different kinds of people. And then this, this confrontation with these three different kinds of people, we see what discipleship is not nor should not be. There's a shift in, uh, chronologically in this text where Jesus is now shifting, moving away from the big crowds and his heart and mind is set toward Jerusalem. That's what's happening chronologically here. In the previous paragraph, uh, he and his disciples have been rejected by uh, some folks in Samaria. And Jesus is setting faith toward Jerusalem. What's occupying his mind, obviously, is that he's going to die on the cross in our place and for our sin. And he will cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's an extraordinary price that he's going to pay. He realizes that he's not starting some club, but his followers would change the world. And the way they would change the world is that because of an all in exclusive passion about a person, and that would be Jesus. So with this emotional context, chronological context, he and his disciples are going down a crowded thoroughfare to Jerusalem. And I won't give a whole lot of filler here because I think the, the narrative itself is compelling. The first person that Jesus confronts, and actually this guy volunteers, these folks are seeing Jesus and his entourage come down the road. Uh, he still has some popularity. And my man says here in verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Maybe it's seen the miracles there. It's seen Jesus heal the sick, raise the dead, you know, and all you can eat seafood buffet out there with, you know, with a few fish and loaves and this kind of thing. He sees the bennies of Christianity and how his life can be better and maybe, you know, more fulfilled by adding Jesus. And I will follow you wherever you go. Notice how Jesus responds. This is almost cold-blooded when you read it. He says to him, oh, 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 hold up, man. Do, do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you're saying? He says, listen, buddy. The birds of the air have nests. And the foxes have holes. But I, the son of man, I have no place to lay my head. Do, do you know what you're getting into? I label this guy the verbally committed disciple who hang around the fringes of Christianity and you see the bennies and the blessing and the great time and how happy people are and what they can get from it and how they can be associated with it and this kind of thing. We'll get to this in the second part, but let me give you a sneak preview um, they don't see the necessary price that's associated with identification. And Jesus is saying something, well, hey, yo, dude, somebody's selling without a product here, man. You, you, don't, you don't understand what this is. So let me just I'll draw some applications later. Let's rush to the second guy. So picture this, this crowded thoroughfare, people all around him, 
folks nudging one another. This, that, that, yep, that, yep, this guy that did the miracle, he's coming down the road. This is the second guy. Jesus is standing there, and after he's punctured this guy's bubble, he looks over and spots Leroy over there. So he says to another, this is Jesus speaking, he said, follow me. Yeah, you. No, me? Yeah, yeah, you. Follow me. But this man said, Lord, let me go, f- let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. I, when I first read those words years ago, I thought, man, that is heartless. Here the guy's dad is dead. All he wants to do is go, you know, set up a memorial service and take care of some family business. I thought it was legit. But then when I began to poke around the colloquialisms of the time, I discovered that's not exactly what he was saying at all. Regrettably, back then, and even now, some places in the Middle East, older people are referred to though as, uh, to, uh, as if they're those who are dead or dying. Thus, if you look closely at the text, Jesus responds to him with another colloquialism. He says, let the dead bury the dead. Dead people don't bury dead people. What he was actually saying is, let your dad take care of himself. And so what the man wanted to do is to go home and take care of his father until he died. And what Jesus is saying is that, no, following me is our priority, buddy. You know, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. You don't control the clock or the calendar, my man. At any moment, God can say, give me back my breath. It is essentially arrogant for you to assume that you can do this anytime you want to. This guy is what I call the procrastinating disciple. And to procrastinate about your own transformation and development is dangerous business. I'm the most important person in your life. And following me is the most critical decision you will ever make. You don't have the next minute, let alone the next hour. Well, then there's a third guy. The first dude is what I call verbally committed. He, he's just like, he just sees the blitz and the packaging and the wrapper and the bowls and all this stuff, and I'm, I'm all in. So, eh, no, not really. The second one, he... He's got other stuff that he wants to get, take care of first. And he says, no, I'm the only stuff. I'm the priority that establishes all of the priorities in your life. But then there's this third guy. Yet another said, I can imagine this dude was in the crowd and said, well, I better speak up because he's looking at me. He said, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to quibble over this. I, I don't, I wouldn't call this guy a verbally committed disciple. I suppose you could call him a procrastinating disciple. But based upon Jesus' response, I put him in a different category. I call this guy um, the indecisive disciple. He says, yeah, I'm going to follow you, but at the same time, I'm going to say goodbye. Notice what Jesus said. Um, If you put your hand to the plow, 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 You, you set your sight on an immovable object on the other side of the field, and you guide those oxen that pulls that plow to that 
destination. But if you put your hand on the plow and you keep getting distracted by this or that or this, your furrow's going to look like this. Decision is, is, is sustained by determination. That's what Jesus was saying to him. Decision is sustained by determination. You, you got to keep moving. I want your life to be a portrait of what tr transformation looks like. See, Jesus sort of thinned the crowd. Now let's flip this around. Luke records another narrative, another confrontation, where Jesus picks up the same subject of discipleship, but he answers it in more of a, uh, more of a propositional way. Um, he, he gives to us in this narrative over in Luke chapter 14, the three pillars, the three primary pillars of transformative discipleship, or what it means to be a disciple. Now, for the sake of time, let me just say that each one of these pillars he, is followed by a summary statement, a universal negative statement that says, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. I've struggled with this text here because I believe, obviously, that salvation is by faith through grace alone. You don't work to get your way into heaven. You don't work to, to become a follower of Jesus. The moment you say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin, I turn from my sin and I trust your Savior and Lord. You believe on him. You are his child. However, salvation is free, but it ain't cheap. If the other side of that is it, it, it cost us nothing to get into the kingdom, but it cost us everything to be a reproducing disciple. And so what Jesus is talking about to this crowd, he's giving them the full picture of what it means to be a sustained, effective follower of Jesus. What it means to be all in with him. So he says... New Testament discipleship is based upon these three primary pillars. Let's first go to the text. Verse 20, um, 25. <laughs> Luke records, now great crowds accompanied him. <laughs> this, this, this is extraordinary to me. I, I have a demented sense of humor. But I, I, I'm thinking like, you know, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, and Thomas, and the rest of the disciples are there. And they said, you know, we got a nice thing going here. This crowd is coming after us. And after all, isn't this what you want, Jesus? Don't bruise the fruit. Don't say anything that might offend them or, you know, edit out the followers or this kind of thing. Because, you know, that ain't cool. Just think of the momentum that we have right here. You want to sustain this momentum. What does Jesus do? So much for that branding and marketing strategy. He says here, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, grammatically, not his disciples. He said to them, meaning the crowd, if anyone comes to me, anyone comes to me, Anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be, he cannot be, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Does Jesus mean a literal hate here? Does he literally mean that we hate our parents? Our family? 
I think not. However, don't, 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 don't move too quickly away from that word picture. I happen to believe that Jesus is not talking about a literal hate, but he's talking about a comparative love. I would go so far as to say he's talking about an obsessive love. In other words, he is saying that your love for me should be so strong, so focused, so intense, that when you contrast the love that you have for me and the love that you have for all other vital relationships, this love, the depth, degree, and consistency of this love makes that love to appear to be as hate. I'm going to use an expression here, and I just, just, just referred to it. Listen, listen, listen. Effective discipleship is the product of right obsession. We're to be obsessed with the person of Jesus. How much do we love him? It's always about him. Some of us love what we do for Jesus more than we love Jesus. But it's always about him. The illustration of this is Peter over in John chapter 21. You remember that scene? Peter had failed. He had denied Jesus. He had denied him at a charcoal fire. And it said the, the, the little girl said, did you know him? And then Peter starts cussing and crying. No, I don't know blankety, blankety, blank him. And he's crushed. After the resurrection, they're out there fishing. Jesus calls them to the shore. Peter gets there. Jesus is fixing a meal. We're around a charcoal fire. And Peter's going, I don't do charcoal. By the way, the place of your utter failure can become the altar of your restoration. And Jesus puts them together. But then Jesus has this, in the, in the presence of all of them, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. He says it a second time, Peter, do you love me? Yes, well, you know I love you. He said, one more time. Peter, do you love me? I've heard a lot of messages on that text and I've read some commentaries about it and everybody has these different ideas and the nuances of what he meant by that. But I actually believe that the redundancy was there, not that Jesus needed to have the affirmation from Peter that he loved him, but Peter needed to hear himself say that he loved him supremely. And then Jesus says, Peter, that's the cornerstone of effectiveness. Do you love Jesus more than anything? I could go down a bunny trail here. I am terribly embarrassed by how, ma ma how many evangelical Christians have been acting over the last 10 years. Our positions have become our idols. And we love our positions, even if they're right. We love our positions more than we love Jesus, and we want to use Jesus to broker our power and position motivations. But it's the purity of the person. Crawford, do you love me more than all the other stuff you're doing for me? 
And if you don't love me more than all the stuff that you're doing for me, then that stuff has become an idol and your Messiah. The second thing that Jesus says to this crowd, and they're, they're probably like deer in headlights. What in the world did he just say? If you think that's bad, listen to the next line. The first pillar is an incomparable love. The second pillar is personal identification. He says in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, universal negative, cannot be, cannot be, cannot be my disciple. Now, listen, uh, sometimes history works against us. You know, we, we say, well, cross this kind of, we've glorified the cross and what have you. But these people knew exactly what he's saying. And they're probably standing there saying, has this man lost his ever loving mind? You know what the cross was? It was a means of, the Romans' means of capital punishment. It would be equivalent to say if you don't <laughs> lift up lethal injection or they you only know, use gas chambers, a gas chamber or firing squad or, you know, the gear, the, 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 the hang somebody or whatever. You, you, you hold that up, you cannot be my disciple. What is James, Jesus is saying up front? When you come to me, you get all of me. And when you identify with me, you don't have the privilege to a la carte your identification. You don't pick and choose the part of the Christian menu that you like and that you don't like, rebrand that and call it discipleship. For you see, in the New Testament, discipleship is not primarily a process. In the, in the New Testament, discipleship at its foundation is identification with the person of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. Process comes out of that. But the core is not the process. The how-to is not the destination. It is the who-to. It is the person of Jesus. And what he's saying to this crowd, and he says to us today, he said, look, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Are you going to run from the reproach of being a follower? He's saying, look, 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 I need to let you know up front, it's going to cost you something, buddy. Can you embrace that? See, we're talking about grown folks' Christianity. Can you embrace that? We're, we're talking about a Christianity that is not determined by the cultural moment. But brings nobility, it's a good word, good word, to be noble is that which is always refreshingly right, that is not tampered by our moment in history. But it brings gospel nobility to where we are. And it says, he's my savior. And I'll never be embarrassed about my Savior. No, I'm not going to be obnoxious or unkind or dismissive or the angry Christian motif. No, that's, that's off the table. But he's my Savior. And I'm not going to be embarrassed by anything that Jesus went through. I count it a privilege. Pillar one, an incomparable love. Prophet, I'm not asking you to be a scholar or a Bible brain. 
That's not the place to begin. But buddy, do you love me? Supremely. Secondly, are you willing to identify with me even when you're threatened to be embarrassed? And the third one is what I call relinquished ownership. And for the sake of time, I won't read these. I'll summarize them. Jesus uses three, uh, two illustrations, two word pictures here. Um, God that's building a tower and doesn't count the cost. Another one of going out to war, then sit back to evaluate what he's up against. And then he says this in verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has in here we have the universal negative again. Cannot be. Cannot be. Can't be my disciple. One is, hey, Croft, if you don't love me supremely, uh, uh, you know, I don't know that that's evidence of following me. Hey, buddy, if you're embarrassed to be associated with me and the price that has to be paid during your moment in history, uh, I don't know what you can call yourself a disciple, man. But the apex of all of this, I actually believe that this is, this is, the, this is the point You got to embrace the reality that you own nothing. What does they mean by giving up all that you have, renouncing all that you have? That's a good word, renouncing. Doesn't I, this does not mean that you know you sell sell everything that you have and you go live in a mountain someplace or this kind of thing. I mean, I, some Christians have done that. I, that, that ain't my calling. Um, <laughs> so you know, doesn't mean that you you know you. You dress like John the Baptist, eat, you know, locust and broccoli. No, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't mean all of that. But don't get too far away. It means that you're not owned by anything. You're not owned by anything. You don't have anything as a follower that you can't walk away from tomorrow. It means that you realize that you're not the proprietor of your life. You're the steward of what God's placed in your hands. It means that you never tell God no. It means that you never tell God how to use you. It means that I am, I am all in. To follow Jesus does not mean that I just keep pursuing what I'm interested in. At a certain point, I have to answer the question, whose life is it? Whose life is it? At a certain point, I've got to answer the question, Do I want transformation and change and impact for the glory of God? Or, as I said in the very beginning, do I just want to get incrementally better? See, when you're born, you look like your parents. 
But when you die, for good or bad, it ain't going to lie. You look like your decisions. So what are we deciding to be and to do? Father, thank you for yourself. Thank you, God. These have been two very intense texts of Scripture. And yet at the same time, we serve a Savior who ex went through excruciating, extraordinary, unimaginable pain and suffering to purchase our salvation to give us hope, to transform our lives, to invite us in to the joy of representing him during a moment in history. What an extraordinary privilege. Oh God, we place ourselves in your hands. Help us not to run from the delightful price to be paid only to realize that you're the one who will sustain it Pour out your grace and mercy over us and give us joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Jesus' name, amen.